Welcome to another edition of the USF Football Radio Show as we get set for the war on I-4, Bulls, and UCF. Coming up Saturday night at the stadium, interim head coach Daniel DePrado joins us. Coach, here we are, the big week, UCF coming to town. This is fun. Rivalry games are, are the best. Absolutely, uh, Jim. Appreciate you having me. No, this, this, is, this is why we play the game. Um, we're excited about the opportunity, which we have a great opportunity this week um, to win ourselves a trophy and uh, hopefully present, uh, excuse me, prevent them from winning another trophy. Um, with what took place last week, we now have an opportunity to keep them out of the championship game and get our, get our hands on the Warren I-4 trophy. Now you've been through this game a few years here in your USF tenure. As rivalries go, is this one different from some of the ones you've experienced as a player and coach, or is there kind of a common thread through all rivalries? I think a lot of rivalries, the, the common thread is just geographic location, and you get two rosters that are compiled of a lot of kids from the same area. So um, they've got kids on their roster from the Tampa Bay area, and we've got kids on our roster from the Orlando area. So um, I think that's neat because that's what these kids go back to their high schools, they go home for the holidays, and, and you got some bragging rights. And it's an opportunity to um, showcase your talents and abilities in, in front of your friends and guys that you've played with and played against that are on the other sideline. So you get out on the field, and everybody knows everybody, whether they played <laughs> together in high school or – they were involved in recruiting battles, whatever the situation. You want that energy. The talking can be fun. But there's a fine line, too, isn't there? You don't want penalty flags flying. How do you prep your team to, to have that fire but still be under control in a game like this? Yeah, we talk about playing with emotion and don't let it play with us. Um, if we let emotion play with us, that's when those situations come about. But... Um, we, we, I mean, we work really hard for every yard um, that we get on offense and every yard that we stop on defense. So to give away uh, free yardage is just it, – it's not very advantageous for us in a game where we're going to need every advantage we can get to uh, put ourselves in a situation to win this ballgame. Now, some people can uh, kind of focus on the rivalry, and that's great. But we've got to remember, too, this is the last time out for 16 seniors. And this is a really special class. They haven't had the results on the field that they were hoping for, but they kept coming back and coming back and working and working, did all the right things in the community, did all the right things in terms of preparation. you got to really respect these guys. Yeah, absolutely. We had a, a senior dinner last night to honor these young men. And we had a chance to share some stories and, and have some laughs and some good fellowship. And, yeah, there are some guys that have been here five and six years. And uh, this is a, just a great way for them to get a chance to go out one last time uh, with their teammates and uh, get a chance to, uh, to get, get themselves a win and uh, end this uh, current rivalry on a, on a positive note. Now, the fans love the, uh, the alternate uniforms <laughs> that – pop up in this game and uh, you're going to have a pretty special one on Saturday. Uh, we had a chance to uh, to see the unveiling uh, earlier this evening. Great color scheme, but what's really kind of nifty about the helmets is the signatures of all 16 of the seniors going along that stripe at the top of the helmet. It's a great look and it's a great way to honor them. Yeah, shout out to Jeremy Lees um, and his staff on the creativity uh, to be able to put that together. And just, a, yeah, like you said, just a neat way to honor those guys. I mean, they're going to be out there um, playing for playing for their teammates um, that they've been with for a long time, but also it's going to be showcased on the helmet as well. So uh, neat opportunity. What is it like uh, in this situation now? This is the last game of the year. There's no getting around that. You mentioned in, in your press conference this week, hey, our room is going to look different starting Sunday. How do you handle that emotionally? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that we've been focusing on is, is, is living in the moment and our kids just enjoying every single second that we have together. There's things that are out of these young men's control. And uh, we've tried to, at practice, on the road, and anything that we've been doing right now is to enjoy the moment, have fun with it, and uh, go, go find ourselves, uh, find a way for us to find ourselves in the game and uh, get ourselves a win. But it's, uh, it, it's been 
um, it's been enjoyable. And our kids have, have showed up. They're resilient, and they're excited about the opportunity um, to get out there for one last ride and uh, get ourselves a win against uh, a very good Central Florida team coming over from Orlando. It's a night game, too, and it's, it, that feels right with a game like this. You know, you want it to build all through the day, and you want to be under the lights. I'm sure there will be a terrific crowd. Sometimes you want to get out on the field a little bit earlier. In a game like this, though, it, it's kind of nice to be playing in the evening. Yeah, and especially for the fans, and I know it's Fan Appreciation Day, and, and I, I just want to give my appreciation to our fans for their continued support during difficult times, and I get it. Um, we're – we're working our tails off over here to give them um, an absolute uh, great product to cheer for on Saturday night. But I want to tell them thank you for their continued support. But, yeah, they get the entire day to enjoy themselves as it builds up to the game. And then uh, once they put that ball down, let's get after it. Well, for UCF, uh, a difficult week last week in falling to Navy. It puts a, a much different emphasis on this game for them, obviously, there's a lot of talent uh, over on that sideline. And as you look at the tape, what do you see from UCF? Yeah, they've they've obviously got a great ball club. That's why they were um, have been ranked in the top 25 um, for a while. And th- they've done a great job. And regardless of what took place last week in that game versus Navy, they got a darn good ball club. Um, they're explosive on offense. I mean, they've put up a, a lot of points against a lot of different teams. Um, they can throw it. They can run it. They've used multiple quarterbacks. They have explosive athletes on the perimeter. And then defensively, they've, they've been very successful against uh, some darn good offenses. So um, they're a big, long, athletic team that uh, flies around, and uh, they're very well coached. Their staff does an excellent job, and uh, we've, got our, we've got our work cut out for us. But that's one thing about rivalry games. Um, you can kind of put all the records aside, put everything that's happened in the past, and uh, get ourselves a chance to go out there and get a win. And it is, for the foreseeable future anyways, the last one. What kind of perspective does that put on it? Yeah, so for our young men, um, we, don't, we don't have anyone in our room that's had the opportunity to hoist that I-4 trophy up. So that's, that's obviously something that we're working for. And then for the young players in our room, this will probably be their only shot to play against Central Florida in this uh, war on I-4. So um, just kind of adds throughout the week. It adds the, um, the rivalry part to it which it, that's the buildup during the week. Once the game starts, they're going to put the ball down, and it's time to play football, and it's just like any other game. But um, throughout the week, that's what makes it neat with every kid and their family and their friends and their high school coaches and teammates. Um, that, that's what rivalries are for, and that's what uh, we're excited about. This is not the only rivalry that is going away across the landscape because of conference affiliation all the changes going on. Uh, I'm curious, as a guy who's been around football your whole life, obviously there's great benefits toward all the TV influence and all the conference changes going on, but you lose something sometimes as well. And we've seen uh, across the nation some really great games that were annual games happened every year no matter what. And all of a sudden, they're not there on a regular basis anymore, and it's uh, it's different. It is, and um, it is difficult. Um, but at the end of the day, those aren't things that we're in control of. Um, but I hope that as with this rivalry and with others, that some have already done that, they try and find a way to get it back. Because I think this is a this is a great rivalry for both universities, both fan bases, both communities. Um, it's great when the when the game's here in Tampa, and we get a great fan base. And both teams can come and have a great, a great opportunity. And it's the same when we go over there and play in Orlando. Um, it's, a, it's an hour drive. So um, I think it's, it's something that I hope will come back in the future. I think it's great for the players. I think it's great for the fans, the universities. Love to see it come back if, if that opportunity presents itself. Your third year, or rather third week of your interim tenure, might feel like three <laughs> years, but your third week. Tell us what it's been like, surprises, things that make you happy, things that have been difficult to deal with. What has this experience been like for you? I, I, I just want to show my appreciation to the players and their ability to show up every day and work hard. Um, there's been some different hats I've had to wear and some different roles, and that, that comes with the territory. But I've tried, to, I've tried to do what I'm telling the players. I've tried to enjoy the moment. It's a, Obviously, personally, it's a neat opportunity for me. And uh, I've tried to live by the words that I'm saying to them. Hey, guys, this is the situation we're in. Let's enjoy the moment. Let's have fun with it. 
But the most important thing is that we do our job. So um, there's been some areas that I haven't had to deal with before that uh, I've had great support within the building, both from our administration, Albert Boone, the other coaches, to be able to help me along the way. But um, it, it's been a neat experience. I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I've got about five or six more days here to enjoy and have some fun uh, Saturday night, 7 o'clock. Looking forward to that, the war on I-4 at Raymond James Stadium. Stay with us more with Coach DePrado. We'll step back and take a look at that game against Tulsa when we come back on the USF Football Radio Network. Welcome back to USF Football Radio Show. We have the war on I-4, 7 o'clock kickoff Saturday night. Pre-game starts at 5 with an exclusive hour to USF Bulls Unlimited. And then 102.5 The Bone joins us at 6 o'clock as we get set for the Bulls and the Knights from Raymond James Stadium. Interim head coach Daniel DePrado joins us now. Coach, looking back at that game against Tulsa, you told us a lot about Byron Brown before that game. That turned out to be true. The poise and the composure, um, national television audience, cold weather, good defense to go against, and he just came out and did his job. It was very matter-of-fact for a young man who's all of 18 years of age. He was everything Bulls fans hoped he would be. Yeah, he did He did an excellent job, and uh, the, the, the offense did a great job. They, The coaching staff uh, put him in positions to be successful. We had some other young men that hadn't played a lot on offense that stepped up and had great performances that helped Byram in that situation. We were also able to run the ball, and that, um, that frees up some things for him. And he did a great job running the ball as well. I know he completed – his first 21 passes, which I believe is the first time that's happened since 2018 in FBS football, which is, which is incredible. Um, but he also did a good job with his legs. He got out, and he's an athletic. He's a big athletic kid that can both spin it and run, and uh, he performed very well. And, again, I don't want to say that I wasn't surprised because he, he, uh, he, he performed – or, excuse me, he prepares that way every single day. And he got his opportunity, he took advantage of it, and I'm excited for him to do the same thing this weekend with another opportunity coming up. It was interesting to watch him read the defense for such a young man once again. And I'm sure you can get a glimmer of that in practice, but is that an ability that you really can't judge until you're in game situations? I just thought the decision-making on his part about where to go with the ball and willingness to take a check down when it was there was really exceptional. Yeah, and that's a, that, that gets difficult when you start uh, when you start in a game in college, and all of a sudden it's happening a lot faster. And those uh, those defensive linemen are in your face a lot quicker, um, and the the secondaries move in a whole lot faster. But his ability to prepare, um, I think, put him in those spots to where something moved. He knew that okay, that that read's gone. I'm on to the next. Okay, that's out. I'm to my check down. And the composure that he possessed um, was great. And he, uh, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. So uh, very proud of him and his efforts this past week. Brian Batty got his 1,000 yards. And while the, the game is not about statistics, that's still something that really needs to be recognized because it's a great accomplishment. And you think about Brian and all credit to him, but you think about that offensive line too. You got a guy playing with a broken bone in his foot. You got other guys that are moving around the offensive line due to injuries, and the holes are still there, and it's uh, it's been great to watch. Yeah, as as we know, um, Brian is Betty is phenomenal with the ball, and we saw that last year. Obviously, when he became an All American, returning kicks, he's great in space with the ball. Well, now you 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 bring that in with a, an incredibly experienced offensive line. Um, you bring that in with the other athletes that we have on the perimeter that are doing an excellent job. Now all of a sudden you put in the tight ends and the other running backs, the quarterback having the ability to run, and um, our offensive staff with great play calls and putting them in position to be successful. All of that group together is where you end up with a guy having 1,000 yards. And that's a, that's a great accomplishment for our entire offense, every single position group in there doing their job, and our offensive staff and um, the, the play calling that, that gave them those opportunities. And guys stepping up, you made the point this week, and Jason Littlejohn has a touchdown in two games in a row. Sean Atkins, a guy who's been around for a long time and 
is one of the more fearless guys that I've ever seen going over the middle to catch a football. Winds up with nine catches and 100-plus yards. That was great to see as well. It was awesome to see some of those guys. I'll throw Chris Matillo in there as well with a, with a touchdown catch early in the game. So you got you got some tight ends that hadn't played a lot. You got Sean Atkins who hasn't played a lot. You got Byron Brown who's taking his first start, and they took advantage of their opportunity. Um, and and very proud of those guys. And it starts with the, with their preparation. And those guys were prepared. They were ready to play, and they took advantage of it. And it was great to see. And yeah, Sean Sean going across the middle. That's fun to watch now. And uh, he goes up there and makes plays, and then he's got an incredible one cut to, uh, to make some people miss as well. It's fun to watch, but it's difficult to watch <laughs> sometimes because we worry about him sometimes going across the middle. Yeah, let's hope that, that it's more fun than, uh, than difficult. Let's keep it that way. He is a tough guy, no doubt about that. Absolutely. You really had some uh, inventive play calling offensively, and that's not a big news story because that's been there all season long. But the, uh, the willingness – to call those plays, the ability from Coach Trickett to design those plays, and then the execution of the plays by, again, some guys that haven't played that much. There was some stuff out there <laughs> offensively. I mean, that was fun to watch too. Yeah, no, absolutely. They've, those guys done a great job as a staff, and then the players, obviously, buying into those things, repping it, getting it um, executed properly. But I mean, shoot, we got nothing to lose, and uh, we're going to cut it loose, and we're going to go out there and have fun. Players enjoy those plays, um, and they really enjoy them if you call them. It's no fun if you just rep them in practice and never get out there and run them. We have zero hesitation about calling any, anything of that nature at this point in time in our season. So they're having a good time with it, and obviously when you're able to execute it properly, it makes it a whole lot more fun. You talked about the room being different starting Sunday. What does happen internally after this game? Do you have – end of season evaluations meetings what's the what's the procedure once this game is finished saturday yeah we'll have a team meeting with uh with all the players on monday and uh, we'll go through a, a list of things that they need to take care of um, as far as moving forward with strength and conditioning obviously with their academics um, their checkout process for going home for the holidays and all those things but we'll we'll sit down with those guys on monday and we'll assess uh, that situation and talk through um, what, what the next steps are for them moving forward, and then obviously their individual preparation to get ready because the, the 2023 season will be starting on Monday when we have that first team meeting and getting those guys' minds right and getting prepared um, for, for what's, it, what's coming up um, in the very near future. And they'll have a, a decent amount of time to physically both recover but then physically start getting their bodies ready for winter, winter conditioning and winter training. You have talked about going through this situation with an interim head coach this time you other people in the past you've experienced it as a player and a coach have you talked with the other coaches on this team about just dealing with the uncertainty and the things that go into succeeding in a situation like this yeah and it's it's the same thing we tell the players just live in the moment just we're, the, those things are out of our control right now and uh, the things that we do control are our attitude and effort and showing up every day and doing our job and we've done a great job with that every everybody is on board with that and this, these last three weeks have been about our players. And then after Saturday night, after we get finished with that, hopefully it's way late into the night after we get done running around the field with a trophy. But um, after that's all completed, we'll take Sunday off. We'll come in on Monday, and then we'll, we'll then assess the situation from there and see what the next steps are. Um, but I think the key in any situation is life, in life is choosing how to respond. And our staff and our, our coaches, the support staff, and our players especially – have responded the right way, shown up to work, prepared properly, and uh, we've just got to find a way um, at the end of the ball game to get ourselves in a situation to be able to pull it out. Coach, we appreciate it. Much respect to you. We're looking forward to Saturday night. Fired up. Appreciate you guys, and uh, we're looking forward to a great night. Go Bulls. Interim head coach Daniel DePrado, the Bulls and the Knights, Saturday night, 7 o'clock, Raymond James Stadium. We'll talk with Brad Cecil later in the show. B.J. Daniels coming up as well. Stay with us. Much more to come on the USF Football Radio Network. Welcome back to the USF Football Radio Show. War on I-4. It is rivalry week. And the Bulls and the Knights at 7 o'clock Saturday night. Raymond James Stadium along the offensive line will be senior Brad Cecil. Brad, thanks for taking time for us. Of course. Thank you for having me. 
We have the helmet unveil here. Get an idea of what you guys will be wearing on Saturday night. And really the coolest part about it, aside from the colors that jump out at you, is that center strip with the signatures of all the seniors. What does that mean to you when you look at that? That's just, there's there's so much history in those signatures. I mean, there's those names on that list or names in that stripe are people from 2017, 2018, people that came in with me and it, even people that came in before me, guys like Demetrius Harris and Kyla Point and <clears throat> Darian Grant, and then, you know, some people in my class and then some people, um, you know, that have transferred in. But there's so much, so much history behind that, so much love for the game, so much, so many hours spent. There's, it's, it's a lot deeper than uh, just a name on a, on a stripe. There's a lot of stuff that went into that, a lot of people, a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears. It's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's really cool to see it on there, though. Well, you are one of those guys that have uh, worked your way through a lot of these War on I-4 games. What are you thinking as you go into this one? It is your last one. It is everybody's last one, at least for the foreseeable future. So there's a lot on the line. Yeah. No, I'm hoping that we can go out and just play our game. And I think that if we can do that, we'll we'll take care of business. But that's, uh, you know, for us, we just got to execute. We just got to play to the best of our ability, you know, put have trust in the system, have trust in, you know, what the coaches um, – in the game plan that the coaches put out for us and just, you know, the belief in each other because that's, that's mainly what it comes down to is just, you know, playing together, playing for each other, uh, playing for that guy next to you and because uh, we have all the talent in the world and uh, it just comes down to the little things. You are one of the players and, and a lot of them are the guys that are on that helmet, on the signatures that have just refused to stop fighting through your USF career. You've had chances to leave multiple chances and you haven't taken any of them you stayed here and you kept battling what have you learned about yourself through that process Uh, I think it's taught me it's definitely taught me about myself it's taught me um, how it's taught me how to go through adversity really you know the the amount of adversity we faced um, not just on the field you know with our record the past couple years but just with coaching changes and because I mean even though we've had I've had two head coaches I've had Four different, four different offensive coordinators, three different O-line coaches, three different strength staffs. Like it, I've, I've seen the only thing that's been consistent for me is change. And so it's been – it's taught me a lot. It's taught me how to adapt. It's taught me how to be flexible. It's taught me how to learn things on the fly and kind of, you know, just take everything one step at a time and not to stress about, you know, being perfect but being, you know, be where my feet are, be ten toes down in the moment. Every position group is a fraternity a little bit. You guys get along and spend time together. And and this offensive line has been pretty special. You know, we talked with Coach DePrado about it earlier in the show. Got a guy out there playing with a broken bone in his foot. You got guys that are injured and coming back and guys that are switching positions to, to take care of people that are out. Tell us a little bit about this group that you've been with. You've got Brian Batty over 1,000 yards, and all credit to Brian, but that's also on the offensive line and all the work you guys have done. Tell us about this group. I mean, just aside from uh, from the coaches and uh, and everything that USF has to offer, that's you know one of the main reasons that I decided to come back was for that room right there specifically. The guys in that room, they're, they're more than just my teammates. They're, they're my brothers, and I mean that. You know, those guys will all be at my wedding one day. Um, those guys are, you know, every day in meetings, every day at practice, we're, you know, having the time of our lives, you know, regardless of record, regardless of outcome, because, you know, we love this game and we love each other, and, you know, we play for each other, and I think that our, our result on the field as an O-line uh, speaks, speaks to that. Um, <clears throat> I'll say that everyone in that room is – extremely prideful in their work in their body of work um, that's why you got guys like uh, Demetrius Harris who you know fighting through injury guys like uh, Darrell Bailey and Trey Jacobs uh, learning you know the other side of you know playing opposite tackles and just like I said it goes just to you know learning on the fly adapting and you know it, it all comes back to that love for each other that we have because they know that you know they don't want to let me down I don't want to let them down um, and it goes for that. It, it it goes for everyone on the offensive line. They don't want. We don't want to let each other down. And I think that that's been that's been our main drive for us was just you know play for each other. You know no matter 
what the outcome is of the game. Just make sure that you know we did our best. We did everything we could to make uh, to make the game better. Brad Cecil is with us. Bulls offensive line. As your career has gone on, you have gotten more and more involved in off the field uh, issues and projects. Tell us a little bit about some of the things you're involved in and what motivated you to get started in that. Yeah, so, I mean, some of the some of the things that I've been in for a while now, I've done, I'm in the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. I've been a part of that since, I think, my sophomore, sophomore or junior year. Um, so I've been a part of that, and that's just about, you know, making, making the bull experience better for all student athletes. Um, and it's kind of, I serve as a representative for uh, the football team. Um, I've been in the leadership councils. I've, bu- I've done all kind of community service, but, you know, the thing that has been the most rewarding for me is my work with uh, Big Man, Big Heart. Um, it's taught me so much about myself and how to, you know, appreciate the little things in life. You know, even when, you know, when we're not winning games or, you know, we're, you know, not having the success that we want to, it's taught me, like, be thankful that I get to play the game that I love and that I get to do the sport that I do with the people that I love. Because it's not it's not guaranteed. Life isn't guaranteed. You're not guaranteed, you know, another day on this earth. So just it's really taught me to soak in the days, soak in, you know, the experience and just enjoy it. Give us your best memory at USF. I'm hoping it's gonna be winning on Saturday yeah. night, but prior to that, what really stands out to you? Is there a game? Is there a person? Is there an event that really seems special to you? So I would say, football-wise, there's two. I remember the the BYU game my sophomore year in 2019. Uh, that was our homecoming game. That was just a big win um, for us at the time. I think, you know, they were a good BYU team, and I think that, you know, the offensive line we had a challenge up front, and I think we responded pretty well. Um, and I just remember, just the feeling after that game was like no other because I know that, you know, I was battling a couple injuries, so it was emotional. Um, after the game, just being able to play through it and play at a high level and doing it with the guys alongside me. And I would say that the other, my other favorite memory would probably be Temple last year when we broke the rushing record. Just that feeling of, you know, that our, our hard work as an offensive line has paid off. Um, you know, doing something like that that's, you know, I forget what the exact number was, but like 420 yards rushing, I mean, that's unheard of, and that's why... You know, it's a record here because that's a lot of rushing yards. And, you know, just for the, the coaching staff um, to have that trust in us, have that faith in us to, you know, basically put the game on our back. They said, we're going to run the ball. You know, if we run 80 plays, we're running at 70 of them. So, you know, we're putting the ball behind you guys. If you guys do your job, then we're going to win this game. And then, you know, we ended up doing what we did, and uh, we won the game. So I just remember <clears throat> the feeling, you know, after that game, breaking the record and just being – being with the offensive line, being with that group, being with Coach Mo after that game, just there was a lot of it was very emotional, good, great emotion, good emotion. Uh, but it was, uh, it was definitely one of my favorite moments. You mentioned you've had a couple of offensive line coaches. I am guessing you never had anybody like Coach Mo. <laughs> no, what, what's not. it like learning from him? Oh, it's it's a blessing I, that's, to say the least. I mean, I remember. Every time you get a new coach, it's always stressful because you know you got to prove yourself. You got to show that you're, you know, try to like prove yourself basically. And when he got hired, you know, I was nervous. And when I remember seeing his picture, I was like, I don't know if I'm, I'm gonna like this guy. That was <laughs> my first impression. And he got here, and as soon as he got here, like we we clicked, and I he clicked with everyone. It wasn't just me. Like it was from day one. He he couldn't tell us enough how much he was excited to be here, wanted to be here loved us as a room even though we didn't even know him like he chose us he chose to be here um and ever since then he's you know kept that same energy the whole time he's always um you know treated us like his own uh made us work to our made us work as hard as we could pushed us to our limit so that we can reach our full potential and you know there's nothing more that i can ask for in a coach um you know he loves us hard he works us hard he expects the most out of us and you know, he's just been all around great, and I think that he's made me not only a better football player, but a better man at the same time. Well, Brad, we wish you well on Saturday night. You are leaving a positive legacy. Be rest assured about that. Thanks a lot for taking time for us Thank tonight. Thank you.
Brad Cecil from the Bulls' offensive line. Stay with us. We'll visit with B.J. Daniels when we return on the USF Football Radio Network. Welcome back to USF Football Radio Show. We have got one of the all-time greats of USF football with us, B.J. Daniels, working in the athletic department now and has been with the Bulls in one form or another for many years. B.J., thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the current, and I want to go back and talk a little bit about your playing days. But right now you're doing a variety of things with the Bulls Club including administering the Varsity Club, along with Lindsey Brower, Mm -hmm. designed it, bringing former student-athletes kind of back into the fold. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, so it was a great opportunity that was presented to me uh, at the end of last spring uh, to join uh, Lalo Prado and the Bulls Club in general to raise money for athletics. Um, But to branch off of that, Michael Kelly thought it would be a great idea for me and Lindsey as two former uh, student-athletes at this university to to, – kind of engage our alumni, bring them back on campus, uh, you know, host events with them, uh, make them feel welcome, uh, continue to uh, support them in any way that we can uh, from a networking standpoint or if they need tickets or if they need help uh, getting connected with the coaches here or even the players here. So, I mean, it's a great position. I'm glad to be in it, and I'm thankful uh, to be on a different in a different uh, realm to be able to help our uh, university out. So as a former student athlete, you know what resonates. Mm -hmm. What are the key issues in getting, for example, a tennis player who hasn't had any contact with the department for 10 years, Mm -hmm. you want to get them back into the fold? How do you go about it? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is engagement and the way that we do that uh, is making them feel welcome. Um, You know, there's a lot of uh, people that are former student athletes that feel a very tie, a very great tie with the coach that they play for. And one thing I want a lot of our former alumni to understand and know that our university is, has been great. It's been great because of the contributions that they put into it. So uh, I want them to always feel like they're welcome. Um, if I can bridge the gap between a new coach that comes in and meeting a, play, a former athlete that may have not played tennis uh, up until 20 years ago, I mean, they get an opportunity to still feel welcome, get to, get to know the new coach, the new staff. Um, and then I think it's important for those current student athletes to know and understand who paved the way first. So uh, bringing, bridging that gap is most important for us. Well, it's been a few years since your playing days, but everybody remembers them, especially that day in 2009 in <laughs> yeah. Tallahassee, your yeah. first collegiate start. And, and I'm curious, as you look back on it now, you had many successes and many great days mm-hmm. after that day in Tallahassee when the Bulls beat Florida State. But I'm wondering, was was that top of the mountain for you as you look back at your days at USF? Was was anything as good as that uh, in the <laughs> years afterwards? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of people don't know the backstory of some of the things I had to experience and went through up into uh, up into playing Clemson. Um, you know, experiencing injury and missing some games. Uh, you know, not having the opportunity to really finish out that season, but. Uh, having to go through rehab, um, you know, through Christmas and get ready for a bowl game that was uh, we played January 1. Uh, so just going through those trials and tribulations personally, uh, internally, growing as a man, um, just different things I experienced uh, was tough. Um, you know, then I went into a situation where I had to uh, be at a quarterback battle right before uh, that game even started um, to throw an interception the second game of that, the second play of that game. And then to come out as the MVP and we beat Clemson was uh, probably one of the things that I personally keep keep uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, obviously, Florida State was a great victory and great win. It meant a lot to me to go back home to Tallahassee. But uh, personally, as a man and just my growth, um, that that experience at Clemson and, and winning and, and becoming the MVP and, and giving all the, all the honor and glory to my teammates and God, I mean, that was a great moment for myself as well. 2010, uh, you won a bowl game the prior year. In Toronto, Mm -hmm. one of the, uh, to me, still one of the strangest places (laughs) that South Florida football has ever played a game in. Mm -hmm. I just remember that big, dark dome. It was winter, so the the roof was closed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things going around the department at that time and and, and with the coaching staff and everything. That was a very unique experience as well. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, First time out the country, so that was exciting for me. Uh, you know, I laugh at some of the guys now to this day, George Selby, Jason Pierre-Paul, Keon Wilson, Sam Barrington. We 
we talk about, you know, Drake is one of our favorite rappers. So to have an opportunity to go to Toronto and be in his his home city and, and area, that was that was a, a dream come true. It was amazing. It was New Year's, so we got to experience New Year's up there as well. So uh, great, great experience. You made the NFL, mm-hmm. won a Super Bowl ring with Seattle, spent some time with a couple of other teams as well. Mm-hmm. How would you summarize your NFL experience? Um, uh, it was a battle. I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the goal is always to make it to the NFL, uh, but to survive and continue to pro- prosper in the NFL is a, is a tough thing to do. And I'm thankful for the opportunity that was given. Um, and even how lo- as long as I lasted, you know, having the opportunity to be a part of three Super Bowls is not anything I could have imagined or dreamed of. Um, having an opportunity to win one, um, playing with some great players, Colin Kaepernick, the Marshawn Lynches of the world. Um, Odell Beckham, I was in New York. A lot of people don't know that. Um, I was in New York for two or three months. But, um, you know, just those experiences, it was it was a, definitely a dream come true. What I didn't realize is that all the different places that I've been, I was gathering information. I was gathering how to coach, how to treat people, how to uh, – what my X's and O's were, how to, um, you know, just be a better person. And I'm taking all those experiences and now bringing it back to South Florida and trying to do my best to give it to our, our young student athletes. So it, it's been a great experience. The end always comes for players. It's mm-hmm. never easy. Uh, you had some time in the XFL, mm-hmm. and, and then you decided to move on, and you decided to move on, and all of a sudden all these other leagues started popping up. And <laughs> right. You're too nice of a guy to say it, but i got to believe you were looking at some of those rosters saying, this guy? Maybe I should yeah. think about this again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'll be completely honest and transparent. I, I did get an XFL uh, invite in my email. Uh, you know, I responded to it because I was very curious. I was curious just to see where I would land or, or what, you know, the XFL thought of me now. Um, didn't get any – didn't get much attention. But, um, you know, my heart's here. Um, you know, I'm done playing. I'm content with everything. I'm not trying to relive anything that I, I think I missed. Um, you know, I'm very uh, happy with how things turned out. And um, I can see it every day when I walk through this building. You did a few things after playing. It it felt to me like you were trying to find your fit. You know, Mm -hmm. you coached high school for a while. You were uh, with the coaching staff here in an offensive analyst position Mm -hmm. before settling in in the Bulls club. Was that just kind of trying out everything till you found what really felt right? Yeah, yeah. I really wanted to find my own own niche. Um, You know, being a head coach in high school was really – a great experience, you know, from a lower level, teaching kids the basic fundamentals, um, you know, back to square one. Um, you know, and a very humbling experience having to, you know, coach Friday night football games and schedule uh, the yellow big school buses and then the Washington uniforms, 12 midnight in the basement of Lincoln High School. I mean, it was a very humbling and great experience. Um, you know, moving forward, coaching here in South Florida, uh, you know, with the offensive staff last year, you know, I, I felt, you know, bigger. I felt that my role was bigger as far as just being there for them um, as a older brother, as a former player, as, you know, just different things that I could potentially help them out with because I, pe- I don't think people realize or remember there's a lot of different things that college athletes go through outside of sports. Um, so I, I joke I joke around and say I was their therapist, uh, you know, but, you know, even now with the Bulls Club, you know, I'm finding a new niche, a new position where um, I want to help our alumni be engaged. I want to raise money for athletics, but my office door is still open uh, to where these young men and women can come and have conversations about uh, the difficulty of being a student athlete and time management and the things they face. So um, just I, I think my transitions have been how can I help and how can I serve, and I'm finding my way uh, to do that at each level and position that I've been given. So many changes in college football, and I guess the NIL is mm-hmm. probably yeah. at the top of them. How do you counsel current football players when they ask about things like that and they come to you for advice yeah i mean i think the biggest thing is you have to be able to market and sell yourself um you know coaches can't do it for you i honestly feel like the product has to be on the field uh what you produce and what you produce is what you'll earn and what you'll get um you know so winning is uh, of course is one of those biggest things uh you know being a good person is another um, and representing yourself and your family well because there are a lot of major corporations and businesses that want to get involved with NIL, but they want to know if they can, uh, you know, put their trust in their company and their uh, dollars behind you. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things that, you know, I need uh, our student athletes to understand and know um, to represent yourself well. Well, I know we have former South Florida athletes 
listening and watching these shows, football players and other sports as well, mm-hmm. how do they reach out to you if they want to find more about the Varsity Club? Yeah, um, so basically just go to GoBulls.com. Um, you're able to find all my information. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very open with giving out my email, uh, Bruce Daniels Jr. at gmail.com, uh, at usf.edu.com. And, um, you know, I, I'm extremely reachable. I want to have that door open and make people feel comfortable because, um, you know, I've even had a conversations with, you know, uh, people who are still looking to find, you know, how, how can they can get involved. Um, because their coach is no longer there or their trainer left or there's been a, somewhat of a revolving door. So there are people here like Steve Walls, like Jeremy Lees, like myself, like Michael Kelly, who um, have been here and are pillars of here like yourself as well. Um, you know, I don't want them reaching out to you for tickets because that might <laughs> get annoying. But um, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I'm very open to, to being uh, reachable, and uh, I can do, I'll try to do what I can. BJ, thanks a lot for taking time for us. It's great to have you back on a full-time basis and uh, enjoy this game coming up Saturday night. Thank you. Appreciate it. BJ Daniels from USF Athletics. Stay with us. Back to wrap it up after this on the USF Football Radio Network. Welcome back to the USF Football Radio Show. Saturday night, 7 o'clock, war on I-4. The Bulls and UCF, we start at 5 o'clock with a one-hour pregame exclusive to USF Bulls Unlimited. Then 102.5 The Bone joins us at 6 and the kickoff at 7. Our thanks to interim head coach Daniel DePrado for being with us the last couple of weeks. Also, B.J. Daniels and Brad Cecil. Our final show for this football season, but... We'll have another one for you in a few weeks live from World of Beer with the head coach of USF football. Keep an eye on social media and the website for the exact date and time of that show when we get a little closer. Until then, thanks for joining us this week and all season long on the USF Football Radio Network.